a professor of cardiac surgery as well as professor of bioengineering at the Stanford University. And he's also the chair of the cardiothoracic surgery department at Stanford. And he's a part of the leadership at the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, the AATS. So Dr. Wu, uh, please, you're welcome. And I will just give you the word and then you can start. Dr. Wu, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All Thank right. You, so, yeah, okay, all right. So I'm giving you just the word and you are the moderator, so you just feel free to start and then if you wanna say something. Oh yeah, great, okay. Sorry, I'm not familiar with the format of uh, this uh, meeting, but I wanna thank you and uh, the organization for the privilege of joining and participating and moderating. I um, look forward to meeting many of you here on Zoom and learning about uh, your interests. I look forward to uh, um, the presentation and uh, this is a, an evolving topic, one that uh, is very exciting and in a state of rapid transition from not too long ago when I was training, every one of these operations was done open and uh, um, was a, an operation with high morbidity and uh, um, mortality. And now these operations are done very smoothly and uh, the technology has really advanced our capabilities. It's great to see that this is all over the world and I look forward to learning from all of you. Good. Thank you so much. So I think, hey, Paulina, go ahead. Just start. Thank you. Hello. Do you hear me well? Yes. Hello, my name is Paulina Ramirez. I'm in my last semester as a medical student at the CES University in Medellin, Colombia. Today, I'm presenting in this latest grand round with Dr. Alejandro Escobar to interesting elephant trunk and TWR cases. As learning points, we will see how important it is for a successful outcome to plan the procedure, the relevance of knowing our patient's anatomy, which selective perfusion systems and alternatives we have, and we will emphasize in the heart team concept. Answering the question, why is this topic important? It is essential to notice that the frozen elephant, elephant trunk plus TUR is the most significant technical improvement to the treatment of complex aortic arch pathologies with a big difference with other therapy options because it has the potential of a total aortic repair. And the most important th uh, thing, it is uh, within the reach of Latin America. Uh, to work on the key questions, I will present the first case. A 49 year old woman with medical history of hypertension and tachism came with sudden thoracic pain associated to dyspnea. In the physical examination, she was alert and oriented. Hemodynamically stable, the heart auscultation was normal and the pulses were symmetric. In the emergency room, they suspected um, an aortic dissection, so they did a thoracic CT scan, the CT scan that we are seeing. Um, in this case, the diagnosis isn't clear. It could be a non-A, non-B dissection. Because of this unclear diagnosis in the first institutions, the surgeons made a sternotomy, where they found that it was a type B dissection uh, with partial retrograde um, dissection. So they didn't operate her and close the thorax again. After this sternotomy, the patient was um, almost one month at, uh, in the ICU with a respiratory failure. Then she was transferred to our institution. Here we can see a reconstruction of the aortic arch. It is important to notice, notice that our patient had an anatomical variation. Here we can see an aberrant right subclavian artery. As working diagnosis, we had a type B dissection without a thorough landing zone for a primary TOR and an aberrant right subclavian artery. In this context, the proposed treatment was a hybrid repair, beginning with a surgery for the thoraflex prosthesis, implantation, and the second stage for the endovascular procedure. Something important that maybe just happens in our countries 
is that, that the patient was referred almost one month after being operated the first time. So the second surgery was in the subacute inflammatory stage that makes more difficult the surgical approach. For the surgery, the selected, um, selected prosthesis was after a flex hybrid plexus with a main graft diameter of 22 millimeters and a stent graft diameter of 24 millimeters. First of all, the surgeon did the supraortic vessel dissection. Uh, in this patient, it was especially difficult because of the anatomical variation. Here we can see both subclavian common arteries and the left subclavian um, artery. The aberrant right subclavian artery was posterior and in this anterior approach, it was impossible to find. After that, he cannulated the aorta and the right atrium, as we can see here. Then we proceeded with a hypothermia of 20 cell, degrees Celsius when the temperature fell. The reconstruction of the left subclavian artery took place with a part of one of the grafts. It was just an extension to make the reimplantation of this vessel easier afterwards. After the aortotomy, we gave selective cerebral perfusion with one cannula in each carotid artery, as we see in the image. Then the surgeon made an intraortic closure at the ori origin of the aberrant right subclavian artery. During the systemic ischemic time, we made the insertion um, of the prosthesis and the distal anastomosis in the Siena collar that reduces the hemodynamical, hemodynamic uh, traction of the anastomosis. Then with the cannulation of the side branch, the systemic reperfusion and the warming period began. Then we perform the um, individual arch vessel reconstruction in the proximal aortic anastomosis. After being of pump, we use the side branch to, for the reimplantation of the right subclavian artery. Here, it is important to ask what happens with the occlusion of the aortic branches. The right subclavian artery in this case um, is anti-anatomic. The surgeon saw before the closure that it was permeable, but there is always an occlusion risk. Here we can see the new right subclavian artery. The patient had an appropriate clinical evolution in the first post-operative post-operatory month. She was hemodynamically stable and didn't have neurological deficit. 15 weeks later, she came for the second stage, the TWAR. In the literature, um, the recommendation is to wait two to six weeks um, between both, both procedures. But in our case, we have administrative problems and we had to wait longer much longer. <laughs> for the TOR it is for the TOR planning it is important to study an aortic branches anatomy. Here we can see that the common hepatic artery is uh, originated alone from the false lumen next to a cel celiac trunk uh, it originates from the true lumen and below we can also see the superior mesenteric artery. We can see it again. Although here it is the false lumen in the common hepatic artery and the celiac trunk and below the superior mesenteric artery. This is the aorta before the TWAR. Here we can see the thoraflex prosthesis before the endovascular procedure. Here it is important to notice that the right subclavian artery was permeable. That was uh, one of our questions. As spinal cord ischemia protective strategies, 
are described the neuromonitoric and the lumbar drain. The recommendations for a cerebrospinal drainage are clear in patients with previous aortic aneurysm, aneurysm repair, also abdominal aneurysm repair, or a bypass with the lima. In those patients with long landing zone, but prosthesis no longer than 10, 10 centimeters, there is no enough evidence. Uh, and it was our patient's case. So we didn't do a cerebrospinal drainage in the OR. In our institution, the NIRS wasn't available. The decision was to use a stent graft uh, from the elephant trunk to above the celiac trunk origin, as we can see here. This is the celiac, celiac trunk in here. This is the end of the graft. At the end of the endovascular implantation of the Thoraflex stent graft, we also had two problems. First of all, the dissection had two tears below the distal anastomosis in the descending aorta, which was almost resolved, and uh, between the superior mesenteric artery and the right renal artery. The other problem was the origin of the common hepatic artery from the false lumen because this fact can result in a type two endolic. The plan was to induce thrombosis in the false lumen with coils to embolize the common hepatic artery with coils and to implant a non-covered CT stent to open the true lumen. Also a non-covered CT stent as this one. So here we can see the coils in the false lumen here and the coils in the common hepatic artery. Then we used a balloon expandable CT stent to open the true lumen. And in this image, we can see more coils in the false lumen here. And that both renal arteries and the celiac trunk were permeable. Okay, almost two months later, she came to the hospital walking by herself in good clinical condition. She had no neurological deficit. Uh, she has an order for a control CT scan, but she hasn't done it yet. So now we can discuss this case. All right, well, um, I congratulate you. That's a very challenging case and uh, very, a very clever solution. I think it's uh, so interesting for me to be sitting here uh, with um, uh, you know, many Latin American surgeons and uh, thinking of Juan Perotti um, inventing E-bar and now we're discussing T-bar and I'm sitting here at Stanford where uh, the first thoracic endograph was performed. So this is sort of uh, historically interesting to, to have this conference uh, in this manner as well. This um, um, is, as I mentioned before, a uh, in a field which has undergone an, an absolute tremendous revo uh, revolution, you can imagine what the operation, open operation for dealing with this was like in the old days. And the uh, number of people that survived something like this was extraordinarily low. Uh, I, I have a couple questions and then uh, we can go down several lines of thinking here. But maybe um, one way to do this is just to start from proximal to distal. So um, uh, I guess one initial question would be, um, how did you choose direct aortic cannulation for the means for establishing cardiopulmonary bypass versus some other artery? You're both muted. Dr. Escobar, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yes, yes, sorry. Okay, how are you, Dr. Wu? Thank you for being with us in, in this uh, special meeting. Uh, 
I want to congratulate to, to Paulina because it's a very nice presentation and, uh, and, um, and say thanks to LASIS because it's a great opportunity to uh, share with uh, all the Latin American surgeons our cases. Uh, uh, I think it's a very, very nice time to share our cases. About your question, uh, we decided the, the cannulation uh, with ET, uh, intraoperative. Uh, we can see the, the ascending on uh, aortic arch. And uh, in the CT, we didn't see uh, a flap. Uh, the problem was uh, in the ascending aorta. Uh, uh, and, and, and then we can uh, kind of like the, easily the, the, the arch. That was the reason. Great. Uh, can I just uh, step one, uh, just take one step back. Uh, um, Pauline, did, did uh, Mateo mention that you're a medical student? Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Okay, all right. So okay. you, uh, yeah, you don't sound like a medical student. You sound like a resident at least. So uh, yes. I congratulate you on your level of knowledge of uh, anatomy and surgery and, and all the details. So that's very impressive. She, she has spent uh, more or less one year of his, uh, her formation with us in our service uh, uh, training to, to do cardiac surgery in the future. Wow. Okay. Well, so you have a star medical student and uh, great mentorship. So congratulations to both of you. Thank you. So, uh, um, I, I agree with you on uh, the direct cannulation. Um, we actually wrote a paper on using direct cannulation in acute type A's and going into the flap and uh, even going across the flap to going through false lumen into the flap. That's going to be presented uh, at AATS 2021 at the uh, end of April. But uh, I was just kind of curious to see what the rationale is. Uh, along these same lines, um, one of the things that we've been doing is using uh, axillary artery cannulation on purpose for these types of cases and then allowing what you did, which is very clever, the intra aortic closure of the uh, uh, anomalous right subclavian, the aberrant right subclavian. We would do that, say, if you didn't have an RSA, but uh, just for a standard left subclavian, what we often do is use a left subclavian chimney as our perfusion cannula. And then it allows us to close off the aorta, inside the aorta, the left subclavian. Then we sew our arch work between the carotid and the subclavian. It just makes it a little easier. And then we take this graft and punch it through into the chest. And we do exactly what you did, which I really like. And that's using the perfusion limb as one of your uh, um, anastomosis limbs. The anatomy is actually perfect. Paulina mentioned that it's non-anatomic because the aberrant right, as everyone knows, typically is behind, but this one was in front. It's, it looked really nice afterwards and, and it's great that it's still painted. So I think um, you know, we should all always keep in mind that we can use these not because we have to, but also because it makes sometimes the uh, anastomosis later or the, you know, the distal anastomosis easier. I, I, I prefer to do the... No, sorry. the the, the cannulation on the right, just for the perfusion of the brain uh, uh, with a, a, a clamp in the, the brachiocephalic trunk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the theory about uh, the, the use, the graph to complete the, the surgery uh, by this left side is very good. Yeah. Mateo, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I wanted to ask you something. I know and I learned that here at Stanford, you often cannulate uh, using Seldinger technique. When you cannulate in an aortic um, type A dissection, do you use standard cannulation with a scalpel or do you use the Seldinger technique to cannulate? Seldinger. Yeah, I use Seldinger for everything. Okay. Basically, the way to do it for type A dissection is you study the CT scan and the TE simultaneously, and you figure out where there's true movement and where there's false movement in an area that's reasonably accessible. Sometimes you can directly access the true movement. Sometimes you have to go across false movement into the uh, true movement. So you have to actually stick one layer and then another layer, and then you send the wire down. And what you do on the, to know that you're in the correct movement is on the echo, 
what you do is you look at the descending thoracic aorta, make a recording of the flap, and basically look at the EKG on the bottom, then play the recording back and move it. When the recording gets to the QRS of the EKG, that's ventricular systole. Right after that, the true lumen in the descending will expand a little bit. So whatever lumen is increasing a little tiny bit in size in the descending thoracic aorta, right after the QRS on the echo, that's your true lumen. Okay? And as long as your wire is in that lumen, then you know you're good. Okay, interesting. Here is also one comment from the chat. Um, one person mentioned that uh, she used to measure not only the pressure in the true lumen, but also in the false, in the false lumen. How do you measure it? Uh, maybe Dr. Yahure can answer that question because it was her uh, comment. So maybe you can unmute your your microphone and answer that question if you want. How do you measure the pressure in the false lumen? I don't know if she's uh, available to answer Alrighty. that. Oh yeah, sorry. Alrighty. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Please go ahead. No, I was I was I was making a comment about uh, not only uh, seeing the wire on the echo, uh, but also if you have doubt uh, about if you are in the true or in the false lumen, you can also uh, put a line pressure inside the surgical field, and use that line to measure the pressure and see if the pressure is concordant or not with the central pressure. Pressure. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that- So to see if you are in the true or in the false lumen. Yeah, yeah I, I think, um, yeah, that, I think that's, a, that's a reasonable approach. Uh, and uh, another good idea, another uh, option. That's great. Uh, can I ask a cooling question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, how did you decide to go down to 20 when you were going to use, when you're using integrated cerebral perfusion anyway? Sorry, I, I, I can uh, understand. Yeah. So it looked like you used bilateral ACP. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you're going to use bilateral ACP, do you need to go to 20 degrees? Yeah, I, I I start to to do that this kind of surgery uh, with a uh, theory of Casui in, in 2003, and uh, he only kind of laid the uh, subclavian, the right subclavian artery, and goes down until 28, 26 degrees. But uh, I have many problems with that. Uh, uh, a type of surgery and, and, and I prefer go down to 22, 20 uh, degrees. And um, yeah, I changed my mind about the, the cerebral perfusion and, uh, and I began uh, two years ago to, to use bilateral uh, uh, anterograd perfusion. Yeah. Uh, we don't, and, and I, that's one of the questions for you because we don't use uh, usually uh, a CT or images uh, uh, about the uh, uh, Willis polygon uh, CT or MRI. And uh, uh, do you use usually uh, that kind of images for the electric cases? That's a great and, question. And, 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 and if you do, uh, that images change your kind of like, your form of uh, brain uh, perfusion or protection? Yeah. That's a great question. I do not image the circle of Willis preoperatively because um, I only use basically two types of cerebral protection. I either use retrograde uh, SVC venous perfusion for short duration arch work, or I use bilateral ACP for longer duration. So I don't worry about um, the circle of Willis. I think it makes it a lot easier that way. Um, and um, um, when I'm using bilateral, then I don't feel I have to cool as much. I, you know, that's, um, that's very comfortable. So if we're doing, say, a type A dissection, where we're just going to do a hemi-arch and flap reconstruction, that takes about somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes of circ rest time. So I just use RCP for that, usually at around uh, 29 degrees, something like that. 
And um, uh, if I'm going to do total arch work, then I'll use ACP and again, be around 28, 29 degrees, same thing. Dr. Wood, there are actually a lot of questions in the chat. They have been very interested people. So there are two similar questions. One is from Dr. Contreras from Canada and Chile. He's asking if uh, Dr. Escobar used a spinal drain and Dr. Fernandez is asking more or less the same, like was, what was their spinal cord protection protocol in these cases? Uh, we, we didn't use uh, spinal drain in, in this patient because uh, the, the time between one operation and the other was too longer. Uh, um, uh, it, we just covered a, a 100 millimeters with the prosthesis, with the Toraflex prosthesis. And, uh, and then uh, we uh, covered all the descending aorta until the celiac trunk. But in these cases, we uh, wait for symptoms after the surgery. If they uh, develop symptoms, we use a sp spinal drain. Uh, just with patients with a, um, a personal history about a AAA surgery or EVAR or a, a revascularization using the Lima, we use spinal drain uh, before the surgery, uh, that was uh, the, our our uh, uh, behavior in this moment. Doctor Edward Santana wanted we, to say something as well. Yeah, sorry, please. Yeah. yeah do you want to uh, uh, do you want to go ahead and read the other chat questions? You can do it. Please go ahead. Or okay, from sure. So uh, there's a question from Dr. Yayura. Uh, why did you choose to use the coil technique to seal the false lumen and didn't wait to see the behavior of the false lumen after the use of the nude aortic stent? Perhaps using the nude aortic stent could have allowed closure of the false lumen and then to make a preparation for the flap and stenting the common hepatic artery. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, Dr. Jahure, we use uh, no, no, uh, aortic stents without a uh, uh, cover uh, because we were uh, over the celiac trunk and the renal arteries. And, and in theory, we have a, uh, a little false lumen to, to close. And uh, I, I think that the, the CP stent has a very a, a, a great force to open the false to the, the true lumen and close the false lumen, and uh, with the coils, uh, maybe favors the the thrombosis of the false lumen. Uh, I hope that, but uh, we are waiting for the next uh, CT. Uh, is uh, on the next April six, and we are waiting. <laughs> for that to to share with you because the, the next that we have to do with this patient is a T branch or 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 a fenestrated uh, stent in the process question from Edward Quintana yes yes Th thank you for the opportunity to, to come and discuss. And congratulations, first of all, to Alejandro and, of course, Paulina. As a, as a medical student, I, I would never have been able to do that. So uh, uh, congratulations, Alejandro, for your mentorship and attracting the new, uh, the new generations to this uh, field. Anyways, uh, so uh, could we go back, uh, Paulina, to the original imaging of the, of the arch and descending? Because I may be a little bit provocative here now. It's a bit late here in, in Catalonia now, and, and, and you know, we're a little bit tired, and, but also uh, you know, enthusiastic about discussing these cases. So because you know, many, many roads can lead to Rome, and clearly now they lead to laces, uh, uh, laces. Uh, 
So I see that the arch size, it's quite normal up there in the mid arch and also the descending and the aortic, uh, the, the abdominal aorta is quite normal. So the indication of uh, to proceed with surgery was the, the acute and enlarging dissection of the, the upper part of the descending with this uh, right aberrant. Is that the, the reason that why you proceed with surgery? Well, thank you. Andrew. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, that's uh, a question for us too, because uh, when the patients uh, uh, was referred to our center, we uh, found her asymptomatic. Okay. Uh, with this CT, we, we, we question about uh, what is the indication to do that. Uh, then we did another CT and the false lumen grow uh, 10 millimeters between the two operations, between the, uh, the first operation until he, uh, she came to our service. Then uh, that was the reason. And uh, uh, she began to, to feel pain, interscapular pain. But for me, the, 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 the indication was the growth of the false lumen. So the Alejandro and, and, and you guys, I mean, maybe it's a point of discussion here. You approach this uh, this disease from the you know the, the midline, you know, with a frozen elephant trunk. Did you ever consider to to pursue an operation through the left chest, you know, one shot operation with a uh, partial descending uh, replacement on deep hypothermic water red with with uh, maybe you know an open proximal anastomosis and replacement of the most enlarged aorta without, uh, you know, you may not need to put any stents or, or do other stuff in the, in the arch because the arch is quite normal. So that would have been maybe my approach in this case. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Uh, certainly you can do this in different ways, but that, that, that could be another operation maybe. Uh, we we discussed uh, about the possibility of just to do T-bar in this patient, but uh, she has a, an aberrant uh, right subclavian artery, a very a huge aberrant right uh, right uh, subclavian artery, and the landing zone for the T-bar is not very good. Uh, if I'm you... talking about the open surgery, though, eh, Alessandro. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm referring to you know left thoracotomy and and. Uh, open descending replacement, maybe, you know, the distal arch with, I don't know whether maybe, you know, left to uh, I, I am a cardiac, I am a cardiac, a cardiac surgeon six, uh, 18 years ago. I am cardiac surgery. And uh, uh, my experience in thoracic aortic and in, in surgery, open surgery is not very, uh, very good. Uh, and my numbers is it's not so large than uh, uh, endovascular treatment. Uh, I prefer to do uh, the endovascular treatment when when I when I can do it. Well, I just want to say I think you're right. I actually did a lot of those kinds of operations, and I don't want to do those operations. There's a reason why type B, uh, um, very early on in 1970, was felt to be a uh, medical. Uh, uh, disease and uh, why we have mostly avoided type B dissections as much as possible, you know, especially in the acute phase. Um, you know, and where I think your solution for a 49 year old is a nice solution if you can get in there and, you know, do it safely and get the whole thing out. But, uh, you know, as I said before, those are big operations with a lot of morbidity and a lot of mortality. This patient passed uh, one month in ICU before the first surgery uh, in a, a mechanical ventilation. Then if you do an, another operation, she, uh, a thoracic operation, maybe she spent uh, three or four months. <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Well, Wu, before we go ahead with the second case, we are good on time. There is a one last question from Juan Contreras from uh, Chile and Canada. He wanted to ask something, so maybe you can unmute your microphone. Hello, hello everyone. It was an amazing case. I had some questions regarding the uh, intraoperative and postoperative management. 
Um, how do you assess your neurological status do, during your surgery? You use NIRS, you use ECG, usually you use a radial artery line and femoral line. And the last one, if, if you use the wire to guide the thoraflex, because when I was in Chile, um, one of my colleagues was really dedicated to um, aortic surgery and he did like a 14 or 20 cases of the Toraflex and he never used the wire. But when I came to Toronto, it's, it's almost the law use the wire to guide the Toraflex. Thank you, Juan. Uh, in this case, we didn't use uh, NIRS, but usually we use with uh, this kind of surgery. Uh, we use an uh, uh, arterial line in both radial arteries and a femoral artery too. And the third question about a line, uh, we use uh, a guide wire in cases with chronic dissection because uh, in acute dissection it's easy to, to, to uh, identify the true lumen versus the false lumen. Then uh, uh, the prosthesis is, is too short and uh, you can put it inside the descending aorta easily and uh, you don't need the, the, the guide wire. But it's a, a, a good option when you have problems with the insertion of the, of the prosthesis. But uh, uh, for me, it's more for chronic dissection than, than acute dissection. And we didn't use the NIRS because it was, uh, it wasn't available in our institution. So, Paulina, like, I, you can go ahead. Yeah, you can now come into the second case. Yeah. Are you seeing now the second case? Okay. So our second case is a 72-year-old woman who has hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and history of high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Uh, she came with sudden paraparesis in the lower extremities. In the physical, sorry, <coughs> in the physical examination, she was alert and oriented, hemodynamically stable, the heart occultation was normal, and the pulses were symmetric. But she had three over five strength in the lower extremities. At the beginning, the suspected diagnosis was a myelopathy. So the neurologists were called. They ordered a um, skull CT and an in a MRI. Both were normal. So they thought in a vascular myelopathy and ordered a thoracic CT scan. The cardiovascular surgeon's concept were asked almost three days after the patient came. Uh, the evolution was uh, long because of this, the decision was not to perform a therapeutic and uh, cerebrospinal drainage. Because she came three days ago. She asked us three days later. First of all, they made a echocardiography that showed an ascending aortic aneurysm with apparent intramural thrombosis. With this suspicion, they performed an angiography where an ascending and descending aortic aneurysms were co confirmed. Here we can see a CT scan. This patient had also an anatomical variation. She had a gothic um, aortic arch and a, a bovine aortic arch 
and also the right the yeah left vertebral artery uh, originates from the arch. The patient had the diagnosis of an ascending and descending aortic aneurysm, and it was impossible for a primary TOR because of the gothic arch. For the surgery, the prosthesis selected was a Thoraflex hybrid anteflow with a main graft diameter of 30 millimeters and a stent graft of 34 millimeters. This prosthesis is performed with an island technique for the reimplantation of the supraiortic vessel. To begin with the surgery, we did the supraiortic vessel dissection. We found a bovine arch. Here we can see um, the left vertebral artery that originates independent from the arch. The cannulation was similar to a surgery in case one, the aorta in the right atrium. We performed a hypothermia of 25 degrees Celsius. And while the temperature fell, the surgeon did a transposition of the left vertebral artery um, to a left common carotid artery and prolonged the left subclavian artery with a part of the side branch uh, to facilitate the reimplantation of this vessel later. Here we can see the prolongation of the um, right subclavian artery and the transposition of the, here, the transposition of the left uh, vertebral artery. After administrating cardio, the cardioplegia during the heart ischemic time, we performed the ascending aorta replacement. The aortic valve was competent and tribal, so we didn't touch it. For this surgery, the decision was to give myocardial perfusion and selective cerebral perfusion. We gave for both around one liter per minute. We gave selective cerebral perfusion with one cannula in the brachycephalic trunk here and another in the left carotid artery. The myocardial perfusion was performed via an aortic group cannula here, the same that we used before for the cardioplegia. During this selective perfusion, the temperature was always 25 degrees Celsius. During the systemic ischemic time, we made the insertion of the prosthesis, and we can see in this video, and the distal anastomosis in the Siena collar. This is the Siena color. Okay. The recommendation in these cases um, is to make the distal anastomosis in the zone two. Approximating the open anastomosis reduces the visceral ischemia time. Uh, it is an easier and faster anastomosis. Then with the cannulation of the side branch uh, began the systemic reperfusion in the warming period. 
the reimplantation of the supraortic vessel was with the island technique, as I said, and we used the side branch to a reimplantation of the left subclavian artery. At the end, we anastomosed both graphs, as we see in this image. Here, we can see how was the heart at the end of the surgery. In the first postoperative stage in the ICU, they made a TTE that showed a preserved ventricle contraction and a pericardial per, um, effusion without hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic um, compromise, as we see here. At noon, she began with a nasogastric tube uh, bleeding, so they did an upper gastrointestinal endoscopy that showed an ischemic re reaction of the esophageal, gastric, and duodenal mucosa. She also showed signs of hypoperfusion. The lactate was around 10, and the hemoglobin fell more than 2 milligrams per deciliter. At night, and a reintervention was performed. The surgeon described that the patient had a cardiac tamponade, but, she, but he didn't find a specific bleeding point. She was coagulopathic and the heart had a severe uh, ventricular dysfunction. The second postoperative day, she was unstable with severe hypoperfusion, hemoglobin of five and lactate of 12. She died in the afternoon. She was coagulopathic and had a multisystemic organic dysfunction. Now we can discuss this case. Well, I, I certainly commend you for uh, being willing to show the, the great as well as the uh, challenging and uh, a real world view of this type of surgery. You know, we go to all these meetings and everyone presents how great they are in all the operations. No one ever shows a death or a complication, but you know that they're having deaths and complications. So I certainly commend you on the openness because that's how we all learn. This is a very challenging case. Uh, have you thought about some of the uh, potential uh, causes for the uh, end organ dysfunction or the uh, um, LV dysfunction? We think that the patient was coagulopathic because the, the surgeon didn't found didn't find any specific bleeding site, but at the end the hemoglobin was around five. That it was clear that that she bled. Is it possible that any of the uh, lumbotic material in the descending aorta uh, embolized into the hepatic artery or into the mesenteric vessels, because uh, I'm always concerned with uh, rising lactates that, uh, you know, I have some liver or uh, intestinal ischemia and, uh, you know, there certainly was a lot of thrombotic material in ascending and descending, but I'm just wondering if the placement of the thoraflex could dislodge some of that and send it into the liver. That's a, a great possibility because uh, the presentation of the patient was a uh, uh, paraplegia or paresia. Uh, maybe that's, that thrombus can migrate. And uh, uh, that is one of the things that the Hanover group, they, uh, when we review the, 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 his papers, their the papers, they say that they uh, do uh, an angiography after the surgery in all patients, uh, yeah. more in this in, in this section than than in an areas. But uh, it's a good way to to see the perfusion of the visceral arteries. Um, I don't know if it, for us it's complicated because we don't have hybrid uh, uh, operated room, but we can translate the patient. Now, another. Uh, way that the, you have to, to see the uh, circulation of the uh, visceral uh, branches, it's uh, with echo, uh, echo Doppler. Maybe yeah. it's a good uh, way. Uh, we didn't use, never, uh, but uh, now it's time to start. <laughs> you know, that's a great point you're bringing up about uh, intraoperative angiography. 
Uh, I learned something very interesting two weeks ago. I did a type A dissection on someone and uh, I was doing my standard uh, post reconstruction completion angiogram. And I always do it when uh, um, the heart is still rewarming, the patient's still rewarming. And uh, so there's, uh, we're on pump and I just cannulate the side branch and then I send the pigtail down and shoot an archgram and then a descending uh, um, aortogram. And this is the first time I've ever seen a problem. Um, the, uh, the renal arteries didn't light up. I had no reason, I didn't know why. So I thought that, you know, maybe um, we needed some renal artery stenting. I called the vascular guys in from home. And by then the patient was rewarmed and I was off bypass and the heart was beating. And they shot their um, aortogram and the renal arteries were wide open. So uh, I think what I learned from that is um, maybe when the patient's cold, some of those vessels can be a little spastic, but definitely if you're on CPB with no systole, the vessels may not be as open as they will be when you have systole. So from now on, when I do a type A uh, completion aortogram, I'm always gonna fill the heart and do it on a feeding heart. That's a good reason to change the, the room <laughs> to do the, the, the orthography. Yeah, no, no, we, we're lucky because we have, um, we have six hybrid ORs here in our hospital. So all type A's um, are always done in a hybrid OR and it makes it very easy for us. And uh, we're also starting to do our cardiogenic shock surgery. You know, even if we're gonna go on ECMO, we wanna do it in a hybrid OR because then it just gives us a, a lot of uh, options. But uh, I remember when we didn't have the hybrid ORs, that was just a year ago, we didn't have the hybrid OR capability. And uh, it definitely changes the way you're thinking about how to do your operation, what you can do, and your thresholds for, for doing things are different depending upon how available your imaging, intraoperative imaging is. Can I ask a question about the technical management of this operation? So yes, I, yes. I've seen this before where people do like you do, put the graft on the, the uh, sinotubial junction and then clamp it and perfuse the heart. And uh, I think it's very clever in terms of early reperfusion. Your cross clamp time is so short for the heart. But my question is that by definition will make the heart a little bit bigger. And is that a worthwhile trade-off when you're doing distal arch work and everything else? Because you're already down at 25 degrees. You have plenty of time to have the cross clamp on a little bit longer. Yeah, that was uh, our first time to do that. Uh, I, I feel that uh, it's, it, I, I don't feel comfortable because as you say, you have many, many graft there, many clamps uh, to do another, another anastomosis. Um, we use a vent to, to prevent the, the dilation of the left yeah. ventricle. And uh, always was empty, uh, yeah. and I think it, it's not uh, too long the, the time of clamp to uh, defend the the time of ischemia, like to to, to do that uh, technique of reperfusion. Uh, you can do the the, the island anastomosis in 25, 30 minutes, uh, and uh, and start again. Uh, it, and with good cardioplasia and protection, I don't, I don't uh, see the, uh, very huge difference. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's fine to do the island or um, if you're doing separate innominate and uh, carotids with the heart reattached. Um, but I just feel like the distal anastomosis is, to me, very important. And it's you know furthest away, and I just want the field as dry as possible and. You know, I don't want the heart to be an issue. So our sequences often do the distal and then put the heart back on and then start putting the left carotid and then the nominal on. Yeah, that's the last anastomosis, the basals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for, the same for us. And um, it's very important to, to uh, comment to the uh, fellows that uh, 
the uh, unless the distal anastomosis with the color, the sienna color is very important to do in a, a zone two of the aorta. When you have problems in zone three, uh, after you are of pump, you can't uh, correct uh, this 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 bleeding there. You have to go on pump again and and, and restart the surgery maybe. Uh, then to go when you go in some two you can uh, put stitches easily and control bleeding, and uh, you can start the reperfusion easily and, and faster. Maybe and the, and the, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The the other the other uh, point is that uh, is less probably that you heard the laryngeal recurrent in that zone. Uh, yeah. it's better. There's a couple questions here about uh, uh, how to reinforce the suture line and whether uh, surgical hemostatics are, like BioBlue are used. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we, we use it, the sessions that the hospital have in that moment, but uh, uh, we prefer to use uh, a BioGlue or Beriplast. Uh, uh, maybe Beriplast is, is m more common. We use very plus inside the, the false lumen and reinforce with felt outside of the aorta. I don't, don't use uh, felt inside of the aorta, like a sandwich technique. I, I, I don't use that felt inside. And try to do the, the, um, the anastomosis of the graph uh, that the graph uh, uh, Step inside the aorta, no, not outside. No, no, uh, yeah, the distal graph uh, stay inside the aorta. It's a better way to to control bleeding. Yeah, it's like an internal pledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another question about whether um, thinking about using a retrograde cardioplegic cannula given the age, uh, hypertension, and diabetes of this patient. We, we don't use retrograde uh, cardioplegia. Uh, I have a problem with uh, coronary sinus in, in one occasion, and I don't want to have again. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I trained, there was like a definite uh, uh, protocol on which patients got antigrade, which patients got retrograde, and which ones, you know, th did this. And uh, I've had the privilege of operating in many parts of the world, many of which don't use retrograde cardioplegia. And uh, I've also, uh, so I've operated in all types of things without retrograde. And then um, um, I've also done some operations and seen other people do operations with uh, just with retrograde, which is uh, unusual. So no antigrade cardioplegia at all. And uh, I remember when I was a very young uh, uh, attendant, so maybe one or two years out, I went to see an operation where a, uh, a surgeon did a triple valve operation with no antigrade cardioplegia. So three valves, just retro, you know? Continuous. And, yeah. Continuous. Yeah, I, I thought, yeah, I mean, I was young. And I thought, I said to him, isn't this heart going to be dead when you're done? And he turned, looked at me and said, young man, just watch. And, uh, and, and do you use do you retrograde cardioplegia? I am using less and less retrograde. I used to use a lot more, um, but I just find that uh, um, single shot Del Nido antigrade pretty much takes care of all operations, and I don't need retrograde. So Del Nido has been good for you know up to about even about a hundred minutes. So you know, we can do a valve sparing root replacement with single shot antigrade, just, you know, down both coronaries and one time and that's it, never, never again. So less, so yeah, I, I know uh, we have a coronary sinus injury every, every year here, because we let the, we're always letting the residents try. About once per year, there's an injury. And every time there's an injury, we always go, oh, we don't need retro. And, you know, everyone moves away from retro for a while. I wanted to ask, but with this um, retrograde cardioplegia, there's no like a risk with the right ventricle because of the Tibetan veins. Uh, As like, 
Yeah, you mean, you're asking about retro and the right ventricle? Yes, also like like the cardioplegia in the right ventricle. Yeah, yeah. I, not, that's a good question. I think that uh, that's how I was taught also, that the retrograde balloon covers the veins that go to the right ventricle and therefore you don't get good right ventricular protection. I found that if you are using retro and you give it long enough, it sort of circulates around, it gets all around in the heart. And if you're looking inside the aorta, you see the blood come up the left main first. It's dark and then eventually turns red. And then, then some dark blood will come out the right and eventually that turns red also. So to me, eventually enough retro gets over to the right also. Okay. The comment here is that uh, there's no Del Nido in uh, Venezuela, right? Yeah, so if you're using uh, uh, if you're using regular uh, high K, then do you have to give it every 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. So then, yeah, then, then retro perhaps. Can I make a comment? Please. Mateo, you're the boss. <laughs> Oh, no, no, okay, uh, I, I was just worried, uh, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Alejandro and Paulina for um, what the two marvelous uh, presentations. It's very nice to see that young people are getting into this uh, and, uh, and the aim is to, exactly to bring uh, new people and leave the dinosaurs out of uh, some of the <laughs> questions because we have to have the, the uh, new blood in cardiac surgery and that's very important. So congratulations, Alejandro, uh, for a fantastic job and for a fantastic presentation. Paulina, I know that probably you have some help to do to organize the slides, but they are marvelous presented, so very good. Secondly, I, I just want to comment with this Obet that uh, in Brazil, we have Del Nido, but that's only paid by the insurance companies on, or when you're a private patient. But uh, I can uh, get what we made out uh, Del Nido Brazilian way, which you, you just make it yourself uh, and uh, your perfusionist makes it uh, at the same time. And we can use it for the same time for a hundred minutes uh, uh, along. So, uh, and this is a homemade Del Nido, let's say. And this can be done also, and it has the same results and we use it in all national health service patients that you have, for example, uh, a, a, a valve plus a revask, or you have double valves. Uh, when you think that you're going to have more than 40 to 50 minutes, you use that. And the patient mostly of the times will come out of, uh, of uh, when you open the clamp, will come out uh, uh, with a heart beating in a sinus rhythm. So that's what we wanted really. So. This is one of the point of laces that uh, we we very much engaged in the, uh, what uh, people do in the United States and people do in uh, in Europe. It's not the same reality as we have here, so we have to adopt for that. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to share with Ma Matteo, and then he can share with Isabel uh, if uh, she wants, and uh, and and give you. What, what the proportion we use for evident because I don't know it by heart, but uh, I can share that with uh, anyone in laces that's interested. Thank you very much and congratulations. Sorry, I haven't spoken about you, Dr. Who, but you're above the level that we are. So it, it's very nice to have you here. It is really. I know that you're a mentor for a whole lot of surgeons and uh, what you've been doing is a fantastic job. And uh, I want to congratulate you and uh, say thank you for being here and uh, having uh, your time dedicated to the young surgeons and especially to LACES. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind words. The honor is all mine. And uh, I'll finish by saying the next time I see Pedro Delmito, who's a good friend of mine, I'm going to tell them that because of you and because of LACES, everyone in South America is using Delmito, homemade Delmito solution. Good. So Dr. Wood, thank you so much. Alejandro and Paulina, thank you so much. I think that's it. Thank you for your time. I have learned a lot and yeah, see you next month. I will, I will say the take home messages. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then.
It is a challenging technique with pros and cons. The decision should be taken based on specific characteristics of the patient. The procedure planning is essential for a successful outcome. Uh, for the reimplantation of the aortic arch, it is mandatory to study anatomy, especially in our, in our context. It is important to know which extracorporeal circulation we have in which independent perfusion systems are available. The intraoperative patient manage, uh, management is optimized and coordinated with the anesthesia and the perfusion team, and the ICU staff should be articulated. There is an increasing demand uh, for endovascular approaches, then this is the future, but also the present. Thank you. Gracias. Yeah, Mateo. Doctor, who se fue? Uh, okay, a todos. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Yahuri. I 